thank you all for coming. Um, I am Sid Steady, Director of Small Press Traffic. Uh, we are based in the Bay Area on the unceded land of the Ohlone people. This event was to be taking place in San Francisco at the Center for New Music, um, but um, our spring events for now are gonna be shifting all to online until further notice. For those of you joining us from outside the Bay Area, our events that do happen in person are always live streamed to our YouTube channel. So stay in the loop if you would like to see what we have going on in general. Um, and tonight uh, we are uh, in for a delightful evening with Janice Lee and Gail Scott. Um, uh, in a moment, I'll invite um, Ivy Johnson to introduce Janice. And then um, Camille Roy will introduce Gail Scott. Um, we are inviting you to sound off in the chat if you would like to, if a question arises as you're listening to the readings or you want to kind of cheer folks on or engage in some kind of share some thoughts or questions, feel free to do that. And we will loop back around to the questions at the end if, if there are any. Um, and otherwise we'll um, just say our farewells. So um, with that, I thank you all again and invite Ivy to uh, kick us off. Hey everybody, I'm excited to be here and excited to introduce Janice. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. Um, all right. I was walking down the Mandela Park Greenway with a friend a few weeks ago, and we both agreed that at this stage of the pandemic, we had a craving for unconventional prose. We wanted rich, overflowing language that asked the reader to grapple with the issues of the moment, and at the same time resisted a false epiphany or on-the-nose resolution. Then Janice Lee's Imagine a Death, published by a Texas A&M University Press in October of 2021, fell into my lap. This type of synchronicity comes as no surprise from Janice Lee, a powerful writer and shamanistic healer. Living in this time of a global pandemic, both death and healing have been at the forefront of my mind. I've been thinking about how sometimes we hold onto our wounds with irascible grief, how this can awaken our senses to living in a time when life falls flat. But there's also pain and healing, new skin tightening over a wound. Then comes the maddening itch as one tosses and turns all night, as new skin forms and is picked off unconsciously. This is how the trauma of the writer character in Sometimes the Death grapples with ethical questions. To kill a flock of moths, to save a caterwauling cat, or to carry out the hermitage of lying in a state of arrest are all for the taking for this character. Like Lady Macbeth, she can't wash the blood off her hands, but though this blood may come from direct culpability, the blood also comes from the way she's implicated and trapped in global capitalism and its direct end uh, to the point that her own blood flows, mixed with the blood of the others in the sink, unable to heal any wound. The writer character's anxieties permeate all areas of life. She frets that her sentences overflow to the point of illegibility, but Janice Lee's sentences and sometimes the death read loud and clear with their nuance and integrity intact. Her superabundant sentences enact a hyper real and felt performance that counters systems of logic that got us all in this apocalyptic mess in the first place. For example, when I think of the trees in Sometimes a Death, I think of the aliens of the 2016 film Arrival, squirting four-dimensional cuneiform that unlocks the door to time travel. Janice Lee is an Amy Adams-like character who translates the messages of trees. When reading this text, I first thought of her flowing and complex sentences as a couture feminine, but on second thought, I think it's better described as cunt writing. It's writing as a cunt from the view of leaky hegemony, a, killing, a killjoy to the empty 
pleasantries and performances of identity and existence in a narcoleptic ecosystem and imploding state apparatus. While her writing is elegant, it's punk, fuck this, unfurl slowly and quietly, like breathing ferns. Unlike Amy Adams in Arrival, her tree translations may not save us from global war in the end, but they give us an alchemical recipe for physio-spiritual balm. I introduce Janice Lee. Hi, thank you so much, Ivy, for that introduction. Um, I actually love that movie Arrival and no one has ever compared me to that character before. So thank you. <laughs> um, and thank you, Sid, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you all for being here. Um, I just wanted to open by reading a quote actually um, from uh, Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, so I think for many of us, a beloved teacher, um, Thich Nhat Hanh passed away earlier today. And so I just wanted to read this to open. The world is not a problem to be solved. It is a living being to which we belong. It is a part of our own self and we are a part of its suffering wholeness. Until we go to the root of our image of separateness, there can be no healing. And the deepest part of our separateness from creation lies in our forgetfulness of its sacred nature, which is also our own sacred nature. Um, so I'm going to read a few vignettes, a few chapters from this novel, Imagine a Death. Um, and there's a lot of... Um, a lot of focus on the non-human and so some of the vignettes I'm going to read are are focusing on different animal entities and so this first one I'm going to read is the birds on one particular day there is a bird flying south while singing a serenade the bird does not have a partner but it sings anyway and as he has abstained from eating for the past three days it feels faint and weak and beautiful in a way it never imagined possible. It passes laundry hanging on a line and though it may just be a big misunderstanding the sides that life is utterly unfair and isn't sure what to do is in the blink of an eye and while he continues to fly south imagines an asteroid flattening everything it sees in front of him. The laundry hanging on a line, a cauterized and flexible landscape over which he continues to fly. Fairly, he is fair. Fairly, he switches direction and flies due west and then starts to laugh. Perhaps the bird does not know to laugh and perhaps birds do not laugh at all or have no laughter or mimic our laughter or have no concept of laughter or were the ones that have taught laughter to the rest of the world in the first place and laughs more loudly, jovially, and understands now that life is limited and the landscape is limited, and because fragmentation is inevitable, he flies straight into a turbine. Some of the birds seem to be huddling together, and everyone watches them. And in the act of watching the huddling birds, the tiny bodies huddling close together for warmth and intimacy and for the act of touch, for just that moment, one can appreciate the great vastness and strangeness of the entire world around them. Stretch out one's fingertips and feel the air that slices and discloses in a wholly unfair, frigid, cold, or warmth. Listen to the silence, the silence beneath the silence, the silence beneath the silence, beneath the noise, beneath the wild, wild noise. Feel the sidereal rhythm that guides one's body and sees, continues to see, continues to look past the birds and to assert the loss of one's entire world and for just one moment realize what it is to be a body without a world. It is the humans that don't know how to be lost anymore. They tell themselves that everything will be all right, and yet they can't help but watch the birds intently and closely and religiously to see what they might be able to tell us about themselves in the way we wish to know more about ourselves, but are too afraid to ask those questions. Too afraid to look any further than the birds huddled together in the park at night. 
It's a strange thing how closely the human will study the habits of birds, animals, their own pets, picking up after their dogs, grabbing the feces with a plastic bag, putting their faces fairly closely to the foul smelling brown matter and investigating the lump with a scientific eye, holding it at various angles, smooshing it around with their fingers, and then nodding as if by this gesture they can proclaim, yes, everything is as it should be. But of course, no one looks inside their own toilet before flushing, no one bothers to clean the dust accumulating beneath their own bed, no one bothers to investigate the matter stuck under their fingernails before washing down the drain, no one bothers to smush around the used coffee grounds with their fingers before throwing them in the trash, no one bothers to look within. Sometimes the vagrants only know where to sleep, according to the birds. The birds perched on the lamppost give hope they have decided. The birds lined up neatly in even increments perched so calmly and intentionally. They give hope that there is order, that they are watching, that they persist and are content. Others try to remind themselves to feel more lost, to allow themselves to wander a bit more, but there are proper procedures and necessary routes and we all quietly go back to the habit of routine. The birds are everything, aren't they? One woman asks her husband. They're just birds, he responds. We have a reason to keep on going one more day, don't we? She asks again. There are birds and then there is us. I don't see how that's related, he answers. She doesn't stop watching the birds because in some sense it is a recourse for her own lamentation. And when her heart stops still and she feels as if a lump of earth, small and burdened, she can see the birds gather and disperse, gather and disperse, and when there is a sound, she doesn't need to ask the question, who has spoken? A single bird fluttering its tail feathers while sitting on a line above the street. The wind chimes barely pause, rustling leaves. There is only one pigeon sitting on the sign today where yesterday there were two. Pigeons gathering in the trees and rooftops to watch the cats gathering around a pile of food on the sidewalk. A pigeon swoops down from a lamppost to land next to the foot of a man waiting at the bus stop. The man notices nothing out of the ordinary. A large bright area in the sky, brightness and orange light protruding outward from behind the line of trees, dogs barking, a bird flutters its wings and lands on a wire to sit still, a single dog still barking. How do the birds know to keep such even space between them, all lined up in a row, all lined up so neatly? One bird perched upon a lamppost, one bird perched upon a wire hanging above the lamppost. The pigeon looks at the ground, its entire genealogy in a speck of dirt, a crumb, another crumb, a march toward the next spectrum of relief. How do you bridge the gap between pigeons? The birds, like ghosts, haunt every nook and cranny of the city. The next morning, the woman tries another question and asks her husband, what kind of bird is that? This next one is the dog. The dog. There is the veering in my nostrils. It's a season of death and resurrection, but what season isn't? She veers, is veering, but if she misses anybody, it is the ghost that becomes an intimate confidence. I wish she could understand how gracefully we can slide into the images of dirt here that the mountains speak, but she cannot hear them. We are all veering constantly and to be alone doesn't mean to be dejected, but still with each other. She lives by mirages, but realizing that the mirages and the everything else are becoming each other constantly and that her reflection is constantly becoming her just as she is constantly becoming her reflection. There are certain things I have become accustomed to. I don't know why I bite. I don't miss anybody because I don't know how, but I know what I am attached to, and that is everything. Who ever said it was easy to understand their real self? A dog, probably, but at least this is a wonderful place to be unhappy in. 
And this one is the pea plant. It's based on actual pea plants I was growing in my garden when I was writing this. It tucks us into the cage. Some of our tendrils reach out and they meet the surfaces they were looking for. In other parts, we feel limbs snapping off, cut off, and still we reach for hard surfaces and light. It touches us in places and sometimes this guides us to the wall, to the edges of the cage. It touches us and others as if testing, as if making a decision about whether to let us continue to teach, to move, to become. We are always becoming, and it lets us know when and where we might proceed. We only know to touch and be touched. We only know to climb and let our tips move forward, and we ask to be guided because we cannot see, but we can feel. We can feel every movement and coaxing and gash and pull and nip. And because we are flexible, we can be convinced of anything. And because we want to live, we can justify any of its actions for or against us. And because there is always space for one, there is also always space for two. And then I'm going to read um, this chapter. It comes pretty close to the end. Um, and this one is called The Death. An environmental extreme is the threshold of all that has ended and all that has yet to begin. That is, in imagining a death, your death, her death, my death, one does not expect the death to be so much more than just the death itself. Because as a series of movements, the dismantling that a death becomes, the dismantling of a person, of a body, of an identity, that kind of reiteration of certain elements opens out into a certain multiplicity. Or one comes to understand that there is only one death, but also there are many, and they can all be imagined. But the question is, which of those to follow through on? Or in the end, it's important to remember that everything we know about the universe, everything we take as certain and true, that it is important to remember that there is always another way to explain it all, to see all of the same things as we do from another vantage point, to arrive at the same point in space via completely different means or which death is the one that really matters. It is possible to be the kind of person who idly waits for death, the lines of the apartment framing and reframing the deliberation of footsteps, the deliberation of the supposed sincerity of the bearings that conspire. There are many sides to every argument. Night and day do not always make a legitimate composition. And so the trees that exist side by side exist as bodies, exist, that is, until they start to fall, one by one. And the question asked isn't the question answered. And as one smells the rot and deterioration, he might understand that all transformation is the certainty of death. That in the realm of synonyms like death and the K or illness and and disease, perhaps the two most closely linked are living and dying, that this is redundant, that this too is a rationalization of sunset and sunrise, a specialization of regret and existence. It is possible to be the kind of person that always gets what she wants, that the constancy of size and movement always work toward achieving an end. And the impossible boundaries of this are simply encompassed in linguistic description that objects that exist side by side or whose parts coexist are called bodies and objects that succeed one another or whose parts succeed one another in time are actions and consequently actions are the subject of description and in all this a nostalgia for yesterday because as she knows criminality is relative. And so the ethical order, which so many hold on to, is simply another system of categorization that fails to take into account the kinds of attachments that really matter. The hope is that in imagining a death, one might be able to lose parts of her body without losing her integrity that she can resist personhood in the way that the trees resist personhood, in the way that they are inexorable and necessarily people, or what is sacrificed in the name of survival? Or 
what is lost when one gains the strength to survive? Never read that one out loud, so but it was calling to me today. Um, and for the last few moments, um, I'm going to read um, just a couple of poems um, from this new collection um, called Separation Anxiety. And it comes out in August. And I'm just going to read just a couple of these. And I will end with that. We couldn't get into the garden, he said, she said. There was a wall, they said. The wall, walls, said the circumstances of the event itself. Within the wound, there is always a wall. But it didn't just appear there overnight, an attempt to track the source of relief of walling. The plants may have protested, but no one listens to what sounds like silence. Silence is conceived, perceived, said the false pictures of edges along the graceful trail, lightened, penetrated, said, said, said. And the trees weren't heard, and the wall persists because that's the way it is, he said, she said. It's always been that way, they said. The tree trees said the unsaid. Why the prayer? Why the wind between the rolling weeds? He calls it smog. His eyes don't hurt yet. Wild sunflowers along the freeway still turning towards the sun, still turning towards the flames while we turn our backs or have turned them already waiting for redemption, that was never the point. Why, we ask, as if we deserve answers, when we never listened hard enough, when we ran away from our own selves, expecting to find a home not in ashes. And this is the last one. Nothing is dying. Yes, 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 nods the dog. This is directly related to your understanding of the world. Listen, when you lash out, I can't help but scream. Arise woven like loud pistols, and I said once that I just need you to listen. But your listening voice keeps conjuring all of my ghosts. I buried that shit in the garden, used it for compost. It's just the fear that keeps calling them back. Telepathy resists barriers, but when I let the weeds grow, I forget to let my guard back down. And I will end there. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, Camille, uh, are you ready to introduce Gail? I've had a stuttering Wi-Fi here, so um, uh, if I if that happens, I'll just turn off my video. Um, okay. Tonight, a daring innovator is with us. Gail Scott has been a radicalizer of fiction, feminism, body, and writing since the 1980s. While her home base is is in Montreal. She has also been an essential part of writing communities in New York, Paris, and our own Bay Area. Her work has included essays, most recently collected in Permanent Revolution, published in 2021 by Book Hug Press, and a number of extraordinary novels, including Heroin, reissued recently by Coach House, Main Brides, My Paris, and The Obituary. Gail has been the most delightful co-conspirator and fellow traveler to many, and for me, a warm treasure as a friend. Beyond the personal, I have so much gratitude for her writing. Gail Scott's work has been not only influential, but fundamental and formative. She has expanded the ground of possibility upon which I work. Gail was one of the first people to show me by example the connections between theory and writing practice. These connections in her work are always an exquisite experience of relationship, moving back and forth, not only between characters, but in relation to history, feminism, the sentence, 
and social forces of invisibility and oppression. In an interview, she has said, I'm ever reaching toward the question of how to write in the moment the writing is written. That turn towards the smallest thing, the present moment of experience, is exactly what becomes expansive in her writing. Gail works at that dynamic edge where nothing is solidified, when change, meaning, and language can be played with and investigated. Her work expands the reader, not in the past, but in the present and continuously. It has given me confidence in using my own uncertainty and erasure as positions of knowledge and even power. Gail Scott brings a fearless and sensuous intelligence to sites of erasure. Please welcome me and join in welcoming. Please join me in welcoming Gail Scott. Camille, that was the most memorable introduction. Thank you so much. And Janice, I really enjoyed your reading. And Sid, thank you so much for this. Um, so I'm going to read from Permanent Upside Down Revolution. The upside down part is important. Um, this is a collection of essays that kind of covers the field of most of my writing. I, I keep saying I'm going to stop pontificating now and uh, focus on just doing fiction henceforth. I hope I can stick with it, but I, I'm also a fairly political kind of being and I, I keep getting uh, pulled away. The book is, has, two, has two parts to it. And the first part follows my most recent novels and some of the discoveries I've made about writing feminism, femininity. And especially these days, I'm thinking about what it means to be a lesbian who, um, is still very is very much on the she end of the um, spectrum. I've been uh, calling myself lately female, capital F, capital E, hyphen M A L E, which embarrasses my younger friends. <laughs> it that's who I am right now, and um, it might seem trivial, but it's really um, important in the way I'm thinking about writing and my relationship uh, to writing. For me, feminine or has always been a notion of excess. It still is in some ways. In other ways, um, it troubles me a lot. So there's two pieces I'm going to read, and I'll start before my Wi-Fi goes down again. Um, both have to do with both have to do with this. <clears throat> so the first is a small passage from the opening piece in the in the book. The book is divided into two parts. And the first part, as I said earlier, is more or less contemporary to the novels I've written. And the second part comes from the really exciting um, 80s in Montreal when things were, ex well, just following the, probably the, one of the most political uh, moments on the, on the continent when uh, Quebec was in a very, revolutionary moment. They were people, we thought actually that Quebec was going to become independent or at least vote to become independent. And there was a kind of really open anything goes kind of moment that was tremendous. And that's when I started writing and with it uh, and mostly working in French at the beginning with a group of francophones who um, uh, and our work was published um, by Abella Donna um, uh, in a text called Theory of Sunday, which kind of traces what we did. So voila. This, um, the first piece I'm reading is from Excess and the Feminine. As if a genie escaping from a bottle, a wild, titillating, ineffable excess seeps from certain writing and visual art by women. Standing in the Guggenheim, looking at Swedish Hilma af Klimt's largest paintings, all pastels, loops, curly cues, I thought déjà vu. This overwrought, almost cliched femininity. Gazing harder, I with my friend in a whole 
row of viewers were leaning bodies more and more forward as if margin magnetized by something happening there, something almost religious or Kabbalistic in its palette of pinks, lavenders, peaches, baby blues with cursive scripted sweet, Swedish woven into the pretty round surfaces. We were drawn by what? Precisely by the freshness offering a critic of symbolic associations with feminine iconography. There was no elucidation regarding this meaning of feminine iconography. F. Clint herself, who was just a mere century later, anointed the first Western abstract artist, knew these works were before their time, decreeing they not be shown till well after her death. Meanwhile, she paraded as respected landscape artist while quietly making extensive notes, cataloging, designing a temple no less to house her real work, which temple's three level conical structure bore a near resemblance to the coiled shell of the Guggenheim, its winding corridor on which we were spiraling our way upward, excited then uneasy. The exhibition's curated insistence on F. Clint's spiritualism, her women's group of paranormal normal explorers, seemed to be obfuscating the brash, almost promiscuous geometries hanging there, emanating something akin to an unusual perfume. Some signal not yet named. One could call it feminine, but again, why say feminine for this work, unless one says masculine for Kandinsky's? Stretched on friend R's Brooklyn sofa, days after the F. Clint exhibition, I am still wondering if that elixir, that strangeness seeping from F. Clint's genial, belatedly crowned work may aptly be called feminine. R is driving across the desert from Arizona to California to visit her mother. That is over the imaginary terrain of Nicole Brossard's Mauve Desert, where in some motel or trailer, Brossard's lesbian family is living. And in another motel room pocket in the middle of the novel lies Lum Lung, stretched out on a bed. He has something to do with the atomic bomb. Strangely, these few pages about a man, written by one who mostly writes about lesbians, beautiful and yes, somewhat feminine lesbians. These pages framed in the gaze of her novel are among Nicole's most formally compelling work. I would also like to mention a certain queer representation, but not what is meant by the term in French or English in the prose of two-spirit author Joshua Whitehead. If one wants to think of art as permanent revolution, it can't be single issue anything. And Joshua Whitehead's Johnny Appleseed, a novel I read during a COVID winter three times in a row, is exemplary in gathering the intersectional layering juxtaposing two tales intertwining in the narration, one Johnny is living in Winnipeg, trying to survive as he can by virtual hustling, an urban narrative that is juxtaposed on their return to life back on the res with their beloved mother and grandmother. The latter site being one of a whole social structure and language and living in a community, a set of values that the first Prime Minister John A. Macdonald and white settler culture still seek via indifference and ignorance to suppress. Anishinaabe poet Liz Howard also brilliantly entwines indigenous culture and European in her work. The women of Bitumen look over tailing ponds like a cloud rack of a tempest rush the pale canoes of wings and thunder to kill the wilderness in the child. But here's that 
perfume again, that perfume of the hidden I cannot put in my English words. I gather about me some favorites. Jane Bowles, whose character Harriet's equally old maid sister has followed her to Camp Cataract, ruining her vacation. A master of the suppressed aside, Bowles' protagonist declares, I don't fight with Sadie. I wouldn't dream of fighting like a common fishwife. Everything that goes on between us goes on undercover. Another favorite, U.S. writer Rene Gladman, whose circular sentencing raises témoignage to the heights of poetic expression. Since noon, there has been a group of whites marching along the edge of the park, cheering for the grass to be cut. They worry that we are doing drugs in the weeds, that the colored people are, because I'm lying in the grass representing that scenario the noise is loudest around me. And Clarisse Lispector, whose last heroine is nobody, a woman utterly insignificant inside and out, lying dying in the gutter after being knocked down by a snazzy yellow convertible, becoming in some estranging transformation, suddenly relevant, alive with the candle someone has placed by her side. Agnes Varda's films, so much on the surface about the ultra ordinary cliched every day, yet ha having entered the cinema quite unhappy, I emerge from visage village, feeling I have been in an interactive experience, loved, nurtured, without understanding what essence in the exchange between us derailed my despondence. An anecdote, a poet I know was doing a reading somewhere in the north to a captive classroom group of teenagers. In an oblique reference to lesbian sex, she mentions the smell of fish. Several dozy heads go up. Some of us like the smell of fish very much. So I called the first section actually the smell of fish. And am I still with you? <laughs> I'm going to read, um, we were talking about the 90s earlier. Um, I wanted to finish uh, my reading with um, a section from um, uh, an uh, essay I wrote of, about writing my Paris. It was first written in the 80s and um, it, um, well, it can't be first written in the 80s because I only went to Paris and it must have been first written in the 90s and uh, revised um, uh, and rewritten really practically completely um, lately, recently. So um, this in this essay, I'm really thinking about being living in the 90s and trying to deal with what was actually, uh, at least in Quebec, I don't know, but well, I think elsewhere as well, a tremendous backlash against feminism, which was kind of one of the upside down moments of my little private permanent revolution. And um, I was thinking, I, I think I was thinking of how to work otherwise. So um, fresh from publishing my novel, Main Brides, a title of inebriated lust and curiosity about women entering a Montreal bar Perhaps I had already with my awareness of being encoded as a smaller subject, been working on how to write my female clown. The act of moving my writing subject closer to the warp and weave of the collective in Maine Brides had happened by virtue of shaping the novel as an installation, the drinker narrator constantly blurring in the telling herself and the women entering the bar. At the same time she was, in her euphoria, elevating them, as suggests the subtitle, to float against ochre pediment and Aztec sky. This preceded my meeting with Stein's ephemeral landscape and blackbirds and four saints. My floating brides and their inebriated reporter were a modest attempt 
and distanciation, vaguely Brestian. I unpacked the boxed French volume of Walter Benjamin's Arcades Project, not yet translated into English, and placed it on the teak Paris studio desk. Read a little day, the volumes, read a little day, the volume's magnificent collection of juxtaposed text objects, thousands of carefully collected anecdotes from history books, museums, newspaper clippings, graffiti, and his personal notes were composed into Benjamin's version of dialectic progression where one fragment gave a new slant or questioned or opposed a preceding paragraph or fragment. What a great recipe for narrative without interpretive conclusion. Under rubrics from Hausmanization to the flaneur to the doll, the automaton, Benjamin not only scored Paris as a gem of architecture and ludicrously beautiful people, he also foresaw in his visual, in its visual radiance, global capitalism, gathering global capitalism. The beauty machine was, he noted, a crucial aspect of the city's prosperity. The clever Parisians, in order to disseminate their fashions more easily, made use of the dolls. They are the true fairies of the arcades. The formerly world famous Parisian dolls, which revolved on their musical sockets and bore in their arms a life side basket out of which at the salutation of the minor chord, a lambkin poked its curious muzzle. A few fragments later, another clipping from a journalist of the ear expresses near nausea at the saccharine doll figures, even noting in disgust that the dolls, as they become worn, are given to little girls to play with. Benjamin did not forget in this procedure of caesura and splice to continuously insert the lives of working class men and women, their impoverishment, their uprisings. Such is the scene from the February Revolution when one night in a wretched street of working families, there was a rumble, a passing wagon. In a cart drawn by a white horse with a bare armed worker holding the reins, five cadavers were arranged in horrible symmetry, standing on the shaft as a child of the working class, sallow of complexion, leaning backwards, this boy lights up with the beams of his torch, the body of a young woman whose livid neck and bosom are stained with a long trail of blood. There are shouts of vengeance. They are slaughtering the people. His, ed his montage composition, its disjunct juxtapositions, bringing torn edges together in a new proximity served as a lesson in how to rinse sentimentalism out of writing feminism, queer, or my own biography. That's it. That is, it instructed my desire to displace the notice of in, notion of individual speaking subject agent into something more aleatory. It amused me that in a city of faultless taste and grooming, there is no way this foreigner with her accent could be a femme in the highly constant consummate French sense of the word. But as I continued the pleasurable walking, reading, and experimenting with sentences, I came through to the idea in writing my Paris to use the participle rather than the active verb in my little sentences to produce the, the figure I desired. For the forward agency was thus reduced slowed down to something like a passive Janus look backward and glance forward. The walking figure morphing into something like she and it, between she and it. If one says, uh, going down the street, not only does the verb become mere gesture, the eyes power is somehow reduced in the fact of going down the street without 
the help of the active verb form. And this in turn reduces the sentence to the smallest unit, extending the writing subject into its environment. What is within being intractably linked to what is without? And in all this reducing of emotion and well-fleshed narrator or character, the text and its speaker become porous. A smaller subject blends in, bending this way or that, depending on her interlocutor, on the assumption of what is expected of her. Concierge ringing bell. Too early. I'm pretending to be up by wearing tights to bed, just having to throw a silk shirt over when answering, she delivering a letter from nearly bankrupt publishers saying, projected little book of murdered women, potential hangover, too theoretical, plus lacking anecdotes. Perhaps my poorest text is a guilty text, guilty, of excising the feminist heroine, for example. Guilty of creating a reticent, troubled ambivalence regarding identitary issues such as gender. And as one pale of skin and gobs of Western privilege, perhaps the deep conviction of being flawed and of creating this ambivalence. In this, Jane Bowles is my sister, is to be attempting obfuscation of the worst crime of all. Hypocrisy, guilt's twin. I would protest that, char that, that the chaplainess walking Montrealer in her little short black jacket, roomy, perhaps not impeccable trousers, is part of, of an honest heritage. For the clown posture is a perpetual manifestation of being unable to live up to promise, a failure subsumed over time starting with the unaffable bridge posture when a minority writer, like so many anxious to please little girls, plays both ends against the middle. She may be a translator, composing language for transmigration from, say, one ethnicity, sit, ethnic situation to another for the purpose of informing the ancient other or she is just a good woman in her womanly moderating function, explaining this, explaining that. It is a terrible posture for an artist, for it requires always reaching some conclusion, some interpretation. The figure in my Paris knows, of course, that behind her small, aleatory, clown-like figure, speaking its full of holes texts, lurks a huge shadow, the shadow of Western culture, her own, speaking through her, against her. If feminism is germane to everything I have become, its perfunctoriness became an edge, at least in the 90s iteration, that I needed to exceed in order to do what I consider the artist's fundamental task, to be a critic of her entire moment with all its contradictory vectors. With my Paris came a shifting of parameters of the expression of desire, more directly to a posture of queer in the moment of the 1990s when the anti-feminist backlash was at its strongest. The notion of queer seemed an umbrella term that allowed more play as far as formal issues were concerned. Although I only used the term much later, I felt less femme. I was becoming a female. Of course, I loved that exquisite elixir that is le féminin in any language. Loved and still love it in the sense of being a part of it, only a part, while also desiring it. But the shift was also a search for for form to express not only an ongoing story of my time, but its historical underpinnings. Gay New York prose writer Douglas A. Martin writes, in reviews of my eye-driven works, I am put to defend my use of a conceptual self, provisional, 
in a way a poet would not have to. This, I think, speaks to reader or critic frustration when confronted with prose sentencing that does a dance between conscious meaning and the estranging distanciation of dispersed narrative or personae. Don't we all want a well-fleshed character to hang on to? Consequently, for the experimental prose writer, the answer to the surrealist question, whom do I haunt? Maybe no one. This prose cannot live up to promise, the promise of what the reader wants most, to get lost in the story. Yet, yet. Thank you. Am I still here? <laughs> I think it's so. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, thank you again, Janice. Thank you again, Gail, our introducers. Wonderful. Um, uh, let's see, it's 7.02. I think I'm going to leave us four minutes for just people unmuting and having a casual conversation and or questions, and then we'll uh, call it a night. Does that sound good? Okay. I mean, I love that question at the end. I'm just going to jump in. I should have let room, left room for others too, but I just will. That question, who do you haunt? Was that the question? I kind of yeah. want both writers to answer that question. Like, what is your, who is your writing haunt? If you both would want to answer that, I feel like you both would, I would be curious to hear. Well, I mean, I answered the question from the point of view of the narrator at the moment of this essay, nobody, because the relationship to the writer is entirely obfuscated by the, uh, the formal issues, I suppose. I, I don't know. I don't. It's from it's 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 from um, Andre Breton's uh, um, novel. Uh, the the question of who do I haunt and and the answer is also on that novel. Uh, nobody, no one. Yeah, but I'd like to hear what Janice has to say. You know, um, I, mean, I love that answer, Gail, and, and I love that reading. Thank you. Um, I mean, I I I feel like I'm I'm in a certain mind state right now like if you had asked me that question maybe like a week ago I feel like I would have answered it differently and I'm thinking so much about um Ty's passing and like continuation and I'm thinking about like the answer of nobody which also is like everybody right like emptiness is also everything like empty of what and so I I, I mean I, I kind of love that answer of nobody which isn't actually nobody it's everybody and everything and everything in between um so yeah, I think I think that's kind of what's on my mind right now. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you again, Sid. Yeah, thank you all. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, well, uh, we have a couple of events in February coming up. Um, we have um, uh, Madison MacArthur's uh, Freakophone World. Uh, we've invited a bunch of readers, uh, Anais Duplan, Vicky Now, Never Angeline North, and Ava Hoffman will be reading to celebrate Madison's book. And then we are also starting, in addition to High Dawn, our Friday night monthly series in which you are presently in, um, we're starting a Sunday morning uh, conversation series around an idea or a person or group of people. And so we're starting with um, a conversation on Atelanon with uh, Brandon Shimoda, Denise Newman, and Dina Chalabi. Uh, so that will be on uh, the end of February, February 27th, I believe, which is very close to her birthday. Um, and it's going to be lovely. Where It's going to be an open form conversation. The three, um, the three speakers are going to talk a little bit and share, just kind of do an open form 
conversation and then participants are welcome to um, to kind of chime in and talk as well. And we'll be doing another few. Stay tuned for the other ones that are coming up uh, later in the spring. Um, so thanks all. Um, it's been a really lovely night. Thanks, Sid. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Bye, Camille, Janice. <laughs> Bye, thank you. See you the next time.